with some questions. So why is it that there are so much, there's so much privacy law and so little privacy? This map shows progress of different proposals all throughout the states of whether they're introduced in committee and so forth. Most states over the last four or five years have um, introduced multiple different privacy laws. Why are there so many privacy professionals and so little privacy? This organization, the International Association of Privacy Professionals, is the largest trade association of privacy professionals in the world. It uh, bills itself as um, the convener. It says it has more than 60,000 members. It's hard to find a single organization that doesn't have a privacy chief privacy officer. It's hard to find a single law firm that doesn't have a privacy and cybersecurity practice. Why is it that uh, the people at Mark's doctor's office do not know what to do when someone doesn't check, doesn't sign the form or acknowledge receipt of the information about, uh, about HIPAA or check the box. The reason is, is because checking the box is privacy law. Everything that we've talked about today, we talked about data minimization, we talked about the ADPPA, we talked about new proposals of civil rights for protecting uh, intimate privacy. We've talked about lots of different options. All of those proposals sift through a space between law and us, between law and real life. And that space is governed by corporations. They are the ones that determine how regulated entities themselves, because these laws have to be implemented, they have to be interpreted, they have to be processed through compliance departments. They are the ones that determine what the law is going to look like for us on the ground. So when I ask, how can we have so much privacy law, so many privacy professionals, and have so little privacy, it's because these companies uh, recast it, reorient it, mess with it, screw with it, but they do it in a particular way. They, they tell us that our privacy is important to them. They remind us all the time that privacy is important. They remind <laughs> us that we are giving you control over your choices. They are reminding us that privacy is for us, that privacy is our decision. They are in charge of it. This is not just a marketing ploy. Lots of us will roll our <laughs> eyes over this. But this is an intentional act. It is part of a series of steps that companies take to make us think that the steps they are, the things they are giving us, the steps they are take, are actually protecting privacy, but in fact, all they are doing is legitimizing data extractive behavior and turning privacy law into a bunch of box checks. So what happens? What is the argument of this book? The argument is that coercive bureaucracy turns all work into data extractive work inside the information industry. How do I know this? I spent a good part of three and a half years inside technology companies. I was embedded inside three um, for uh, lengths of time where I sat in on meetings, I interviewed people, followed people from one room to the next, um, and uh, talked, to, uh, talked to workers of all kinds, um, engineers, uh, salespersons, privacy professionals, lawyers, executives, invest um, uh, angel investors. And then outside of uh, the embedded uh, process, I also interviewed current and former employees of big tech companies in Silicon Valley. So this comes from an extensive amount of field work uh, that really sought to ask the question about, you know, are, are the things that chief privacy officers are telling us, is it real, right? Even if we, let's assume for the moment that the, the goals, the earnest desire to make privacy better, to improve our privacy. Let's assume that our chief privacy officers do really care. Why is that stuff not trickling down to the ground? It's because all of that is filtered through corporate organizations. And the result of all of the, all result of this bureaucracy is not just to co-opt privacy professionals and to co-opt uh, laws that are compliance oriented, it actually ends up making law in this iterative process. The result is that privacy is not just performative, it's not just these boxes. Privacy is also private. what we consider, what the people working in Mark's doctor's office consider to be privacy law are endogenous creations of, of industry themselves. Right? How is it that the, the specific provisions about audits, about record keeping, 
um, about individual rights, about how you navigate requests or take down requests, or how you determine um, or uh, how you process a uh, impact assessment. How is it possible that all of those things had been done by corporations, by the information industry for so many years, and then all of a sudden, those exact practices, those exact procedures, find their way into FTC consent decrees. They find their way into the GDPR. Right? They find their way into agreements between state attorneys general and the companies that they're going after. Because we have been normalized. Privacy professionals have been normalized. Privacy lawyers have been normalized. Everyone has been normalized into thinking that privacy law is a certain thing. And companies are responsible for that. It's not that there was some Mr. Burns style evil <laughs> CEO sitting in some smoke filled room deciding this is going to be my plan. It's far more of a series of very intentional choices to legitimate data extractive behavior and in so doing ends up creating privacy law, privacy law in a way, and I'm sorry to say this, that makes me feel, it makes me worry that all of the proposals that we've heard here today, data minimization, duties of loyalty, civil rights, are just not going to work because we have managerialized privacy law in such a way as to make it useless. Why is there so much privacy law and nothing has changed for us on the ground? Because companies have ensured that that would be the case. So for a few minutes, I'll give you some examples. And they've done this in three different areas. They've combined control over privacy discourse with control over privacy compliance with control over privacy design. All of those things are filtered through their own corporations. So let's start with discourse. Um, that's a common theme. We've already talked about that. Neil probably has the best explication of how the risks and the dangers of privacy as control. But what companies do is they take people from law schools like this who may have, uh, who may have taken Neil's class and Woody's classes and Danielle's classes and Mark's who, who understand that privacy should not just be about control. But what they end up doing is because of the way that because of the assignments that they give them, because of the work product that they assign to these teams, the even people who think and understand and recognize that privacy as control is insufficient, all their work is about control. All their work is about transparency. And over time, the result is simply, well, this is what privacy is. When you talk to them and ask them, well, have you considered thinking about doing uh, something else, thinking about not collecting data on sexual orientation in this purpose? That's not what we do. That's not what privacy is. Privacy is what a company has normalized them to think. And that doesn't just affect us. It is a concerted effort by companies to do that to their own employees, and their own employees don't even realize. It's a false consciousness. People can say, people can earnestly believe that people hire me, and people, and people interviewees have said this to me, people hire me, them, not me, to when they, are, when they care about privacy. That's great. Okay, so what are the things that you've done? Oh, well, look at all of my work products. Look at all of the policies that I wrote. Look at the impact assessments that I wrote. Look at these reports that I wrote that I disseminated and sent over email. Well, it just so happens that that report is about how to improve transparency. Or that that policy is a little chart that check where people, where engineers have to check boxes. So there can be a stack of papers that a privacy professional has done, but if all of it is either managerialized or turned into a chart or focused on discourses about privacy that legitimate data extracted behavior, what's the point? Other than to make you feel like you had a job to do. But the point from the corporation standpoint is that it provides this patina of legitim legitimacy over what they're doing. So uh, that cues onto the second stage, which is compliance. Laws like the GDPR and the California Consumer Privacy Act, I know it's a bit of a sin to critique the California Consumer Privacy Act literally in California. <laughs> These laws directly lend themselves to managerialized practices. So an audit, uh, what Julie Cohen calls a, something like a tool on the periphery of the regulatory state. These laws require assessments and audits, but one of the things you learn when you go inside industry is these are not audits like you and I think they are. What they are is a person that the company hires themselves, comes in and sits in a room and asks an executive, 
are you in compliance with section 3.2 of the 2011 FTC consent decree? And the answer is C, Exhibit I, and this is a true story. And Exhibit I is a letter from the executive saying we are in compliance with Section 3.2 <laughs> of the 2011 consent decree, period, signed, and that's it. That satisfies the FTC's assessment requirement. And you're surprised at that, right? Because audits sound like a really good idea. Everyone has, a, the, a, the number of law review articles in the last five years that have proposed audits as a solution or an accountability mechanism increases by, a, by, a, by two, ta two times each year. It's becoming such a big deal. New governance, collaborative governance. But these tools are not actual tools of accountability. Partly because of things going on in the FTC, the limitations of regulation, neoliberal governance, pro public-private partnerships, the weaknesses of the FTC, the uh, extraction from the FTC of talent and money such that all they can do is rely on companies to police themselves. Again, not a, not a problem unique to privacy. But because of these problems, the FTC can only rely on what companies tell them themselves. Impact assessments. Again, in law reviews, impact assessments are hugely popular in uh, content moderation, in privacy, in environmental law, in so many different areas. Let's have them complete an impact assessment so we know that the algorithm that they just built conforms with ethical guidelines. That sounds great. But what actually is the impact assessment? Well, when you go inside the companies, you realize that although an impact assessment is supposed to be this in-depth report wherein the people who are designing and using these tools assesses and actually analyzes the effects of the using the tool on, say, a marginalized population or on whatever you're trying to, whatever you're trying to consider, turns into something that looks like this. A little chart with six questions and two columns that say yes, or no. And it's not just that, it's with a note on the top to noting, asking the engineers to just check no. <laughs> and I saw this on every single engineer's desk at one of the companies I was involved in, and large companies with people who used to work, and people that I interviewed who worked at these companies, these were common. These types, not that exact thing, but these types of heuristics for, com for completing privacy impact assessments and AI impact assessments were common. So common that people don't really know that that's not what an impact assessment is supposed to look like. Another example. So lots of companies will say, lots of people will say in their privacy policies, and they will say publicly that um, you have privacy on our platform. You can like, think about Facebook. I'm not saying that the person who said this was Facebook. It's not. It's a confidentiality agreement. But let's think about Facebook. Lots of companies will allow you to disclose information, to say things on a platform and say, oh no, just because you're disclosing things on our platform doesn't mean you have no control over it. You still have some privacy on our platform. Okay, that's fine. So then I asked the general counsel, so how does that square with the fact that in 2018 or in 2020 or wherever it was, you argued in court that no user has any privacy on your platform? I slid over the brief <laughs> with, the, with, the, with the sentence highlighted. And his response was, well, nothing is going to stop me from being a zealous advocate for my client. So re, it's almost gaslighting, right? Because what this, what this general counsel has done is they have, he has recast the idea that you, his job is to represent, their, represent his client, represent his boss, as a, a totally legitimate reason to lie to their consumers. And that's not what privacy law is supposed to do, or that's not what people who want privacy law want these laws to be passed to do. As a result, even, the, even people like this, who you would imagine this guy is doing this because he's um, opportunistic, or he's mischievous, or he's doing it intentionally, or he doesn't care about privacy. No, this person, these people, all of them say and believe earnestly that they care about privacy. But the things that they're doing inside their companies, they don't even realize how extractive or how legitimating their, their practices are because they're so used to it. And the final thing for just a couple of minutes is the process of design. So in the design process where you're building a tool, coders and programmers are building a tool, there are lots of different ways to structure a design team in order to use the organizational structures of the company to minimize privacy's impact on design. 
And there are so many of these that I talk about in the book. One is um, you hire a, privacy, a team of privacy engineers and you tell the world about it. We are changing things because we're finally hiring privacy engineers, which is a field of people who are coders, programmers, who are technical experts, technologists, whose specific job is to code for privacy. You hire them, but you put them at the end of the process in a team that is siloed from every other team and give them kind of like an auditor's job. I say, all right, the product is done. Now your job is to read through the 13 million lines of code that all of your colleagues have written already and check for privacy issues. Great. <laughs> Oh, and by the way, we're due to launch in a week. So if you can get that done in just like an hour, that'd be awesome. So what these companies do is they, they may hire, they may make a lot of hay about bringing in technological expertise about privacy into the design process, but at the same time, they'll silo different teams. They'll, they won't tell one team what another team is doing, so even if someone identifies a privacy issue, they have no power to do anything about it. Here's another one for those lawyers in the room, and then I'll move on to a few conclusions. For those lawyers in the room, there are big companies will often have lots of privacy lawyers and lots of design teams, and they will often assign a lawyer to a particular product, for example, or a particular business line, maybe a series of lawyers. There are some companies that prohibit, as a matter of organizational structure, those lawyers from affirmatively going to the design teams to say, hey, any problems? Can I help with anything? They require the technologists to bring the issue up to the lawyer. It has to go up from the ground. So what happens is, first you have to rely on the engineer to spot the privacy issue. Not an automatic thing. If they do, they report it to their, co their manager, probably also a former coder. And then if they, if they identify it, then they report it to their manager, probably a former coder. Then to the project manager, who then finally will report it to the lawyer. The organizational structure will keep these people separate such that it minimizes the opportunity for any of these issues to both get spotted and get, a, get addressed. And there are so many other examples in the book, but also how these examples make the job of being a privacy professional and a privacy lawyer really precarious, particularly for women, particularly for persons of color inside these companies. And these companies brag a whole lot about hiring diverse privacy professionals to integrate ideas of affected communities into these products. Okay, so what does this mean for things like data minimization? What does this mean for things like a duty of loyalty? Things that, re pro important proposals that really important and really smart scholars and advocates have, uh, have written quite a bit about. What does this mean for the ADPPA? Now, I'm going to be the, uh, Alan asked me to be the chair elect of the of EPIC, and I'm happy to do it. I don't think I told him that before, so it's uh, <laughs> good news. Happy to do it. Breaking news. Um, but I am much more concerned that the ADPPA is going to entrench more of this legitimization of data extractive, pro uh, data extractive behavior because it maintains so many of the same managerialist practices that have become so normalized in what privacy law is today. So here's a good thought process, and maybe a good idea for, a, for my next project is to see how companies are trying to implement fiduciary duties or duties of loyalty on the inside. But what I worry is that those are going to become checkboxes and compliance oriented as well. All right, I have a duty of loyalty. That means certain things. I'm going to write a report. I'm going to turn this, I'm going to assess. I'm going to write an impact assessment. Maybe we have loyalty impact assessments now. Because compliance departments are what pass for regulation in the neoliberal managerial state. And when impact assessments are what pass for regulation, we get no regulation. We get no accountability. We get public-private partnerships in which regulated entities themselves determine what the law is. And that's not a world that I want to live in. Unfortunately, it is the privacy world that we live in. What I think we need, on the other hand, although I very much respect the discourse about duties of loyalty and data minimization, things that I very much agree with and think are super important for us to ways of thinking about how we can regulate privacy. I don't think the managerial state is going to, I don't think these proposals are immune from the, co from the corrupting effect of the managerial state. As an alternative, other than burning it all down and building it back up again, maybe we, not, maybe we need to start thinking more structurally. Um, what about things like a uh, technological public options that are simply 
simply privacy protective, that provide real alternatives for people who don't want to be part of the data extractive economy? What about requiring companies who um, sell their algorithms to the government to use simply have to give up their trade secrecy in order to gain that contract? Which, again, all these kind of proposals go around the power of compliance departments, uh, prevent uh, mischievous work inside companies from weakening or co-opting privacy law because they don't depend on compliance for on, on procedural compliance for um, function. Things like civil rights or human rights approach again would not require would on one hand like the work of Lori Edelman has shown for example can be entirely co-opted by uh, compliance departments. Lori Edelman is a, a socio legal scholar at Berkeley whose canonical work has asked, why is it that we have had the Civil Rights Act for more than, for, for more than 70 years, the Title VII the Civil Rights Act for so long, and we see no appreciable, significant improvement in gender diversity in so many industries? Well, it's because these laws have been turned into managerial compliance. You're not judged, your, comp your compliance with Title VII is not judged based on equity or actual equality in the people that you hire, it's judged by whether you have an officer, whether you have a diversity officer, whether you have an appeals process in place, whether you have a system for navigating complaints. Similarly, privacy is just the same way. Your compliance with privacy law or your um, your insurance that privacy exists for your consumers is not judged by their actual privacy of the privacy defaults or the privacy protections of your tools. It's simply judged by whether you have had an audit, by whether you have a privacy officer, by whether you keep records. And that's what privacy law on the ground <coughs> really is. And I don't know really a way out of that. Um, <laughs> so, I hate to end on a, on a note. Um, Wait, Ari, right, how about we uncheck, well, we have a checklist, like, we uncheck list the checklist or something? Like, is that a way to maybe describe Well, that? maybe is, that's what the panel no can help us. There's right? not no way out. And this right. is the work that Julie Cohen and I are doing now. Yeah. They're trying to figure out what, how to bring the rule of law to this managerial turn in privacy. But maybe the rest of the panel can think about, can help us think about a way forward. So thank you. Yeah. So to answer those specific questions, uh, Andrew Seltz is an assistant professor of law at the UCLA School of Law. Manny Shravastava is a professor of electrical Compu and computer engineering at the Samuel and uh, uh, the ECE department vice chair at the Samuel School of Law at the U UCLA. Uh, Woody Hartzog, you know, uh, same with School of Engineering, thanks. Uh, Woody Hartzog, you already know. And Alessia Zernetta is an SJD uh, candidate here at UCLA. All right, so why don't we start with the questions? Yeah. We can start from the end, Woody. Oh, we can start with me. Okay, that yeah. sounds great. Um, so uh, I had planned to give uh, uh, a modest defense of a part of uh, Ari's book uh, where, that he calls the encryption trap. Mm. Um, and I, I wanted to take the uh, opportunity to have uh, a little sort of cross conversation between our books, but you, I, this is a sort of wonderful opportunity to do. Um, and, uh, but also now it looks like I'm going to need to defend David Ward. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, I can I, ask softball questions if you'd like. Right. right. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I may punt some of that to, to some, some more of the Q&A. Um, but first, let me actually go with my uh, prepared comments. So, um, I love reading this book. I love reading the book in draft form. I love reading the book in its final form. I'm going to be citing it for a lot of different propositions, in, in fact, too, um, uh, at now and in the future. Um, and one of the things that I really wanted to focus on, specifically in Ari's book, is the idea that one of the ways in which privacy gets short shrift in this sort of managerialization uh, process is by a lot of people that are working on this conflating privacy and security. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the idea is uh, that um, it, sometimes there will be a, something like encryption, right? And they'll, it, you know, Ari would ask a question like, um, and I meant, oh, I flagged it. It's, it's flagged <laughs> over there. I was going to read it aloud, but um, I'm going to paraphrase if you, yeah, if you yeah. don't. Um, <laughs> If you don't mind, you would ask a question like, what do you do to protect 
privacy. Um, and they said, oh, well, we do such a great job protecting privacy, we implemented encryption. Um, and you're like, that's great. That's, you know, one part maybe of privacy, but what else are you doing? Like, no, that's it. Right? They're like, we encrypt everything, therefore privacy is done. Right? And um, I get that this is, you know, of course, the worry of this is that security is just one aspect of privacy because privacy um, is amorphous and squishy as a term, which we've already talked about, uh, as, as Neil has already talked about, then you're able to basically plausibly say, we have done that because who are you to prove me wrong? Privacy can mean anything, and so we, we get into all these things. Now, um, the first thing I want to talk about is, is certainly it, it has to be true that there are there is a lot of focus on security, and that, that takes up a lot of people's um, uh, space with respect to privacy, and as I talk about in, in Breach, as Dan and I talk about in Breach, there tends to be um, simultaneously this sort of bifurcation where the CISO and the CPO don't always talk together or work together, that data security is often housed in um, uh, IT and, and engineering and, and data privacy is housed in compliance, and they bring in privacy sort of at the very end or, you know, tack it on. Um, and so, um, these sort of standard binaries, uh, as you demonstrate, are not always helpful, but I wonder if the story um, is a little more complicated. Um, and specifically, I was sort of wondering about when these categories tend to really let us down and thinking about um, when conflating privacy and security is bad. Um, and then I actually want to take a second to talk about when it may be good. Mm. Um, uh, or, uh, or, or when um, this sort of uh, thinking about security as, the, as a main way of doing privacy could actually be helpful. So I think it's bad. One of the examples is many of us, have, I don't think we've discussed it yet, Clearview AI, um, which is it's great. I mean, if anyone here has a LinkedIn page or a Facebook profile, I've got some bad news for you. All of your pro photos are probably scraped and being um, part of Clearview AI's package that now makes you, unfortunately, universally recognizable wherever you go um, for the rest of your lives. And I apologize, but there's nowhere left to hide. Um, so this was emphatically not a data breach, right? Like, I mean, this was the sort of thing where they were like, you just put this out there. You gave away this information. It's not as though we sort of backdoored it into some uh, backdoor thing. And so um, yet we sort of reached the same outcome as if this information was, was sort of breached and, and widely available. And so I think it's worth thinking about um, the ways in which uh, a lot of these, the, the binary hurts us there because we, we, we really struggle to, to find ways to hold Clearview AI accountable that if they had hacked the servers and gotten this exact same information, they would have instantly sort of, like, with ease been held accountable through data security law. But I also want to think about um, something that, that you actually said earlier about the importance, the persuasive um, uh, effect of particular framing or, or use of language and what that can get you. Um, I actually wonder if there's a potential that's being left on the table uh, with rejecting uh, with, think, with rejecting the idea that doing really good security is a way to do privacy. And it's not in the way that you think, right? So I think that your criticism is about um, uh, your criticism is actually about the ways in which it's just security and there's a lot more privacy than just security. But here's the thing about security, and I wonder if there's a way to tap into this. Everybody loves state of security from a, a sort of collective standpoint in that um, it's bipartisan typically. Uh, regulators have acted the quickest. Um, in the ANPR, the Advanced Service of Proposed Rulemaking, issued by the Federal Trade Commission, Commissioner Phillips, uh, had a very prominent dissent, and he said, if this had just been data security, I would have been on board. Right? Right. And I think that that's actually um, consistently true in Washington, D.C. And so I always sort of throw this out as a topic of conversation. Um, what would it look like if we embrace security um, more for its privacy-solving purposes? Um, and, and what I mean by that is actually thinking about Danielle's book, which she gets into a lot of this idea around the catastrophic failures that can occur when your information is compromised. And a lot of the incidents that you describe in your book, even though they are extreme privacy violations, are the result of data security failures. Um, and so just sort of thinking about sort of ways in which we can leverage that um, a little more. And 
Um, I, that's, I'll, I'll stop right now because I've gone on too long. I apologize, but I'll leave it to Neil to defend data loyalty, which is substantively rigorous, and I think <laughs> a way around, a, a significant way around managerialism if done right, because it has very specific uh, substantive rules that would be difficult to wiggle out of. Can we do a conversation back and forth instead of going one to the next? Sure. So, um, thank you, Neil, uh, and Woody. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Wendy. Uh, so, uh, the your the conflation of what just to add to your point, that what the conflation of privacy and security does, I think, most significantly, such that I'm not sure that any that there can be any positive from it is both what you mentioned before, so it's like, first, it's like once we're done, we did security, we're done, right? So that's always gonna be there. But also what securitizing privacy does is it technologizes privacy. It limits privacy to what security people, and security people are coders, engineers, computer scientists, it limits to what they can do. And when your vision of privacy is only what is codable, right, the, then you are limited to a very narrow band of options, but also a very narrow band of people who are going to be doing it, and it's then becomes so easy to say, well, I can't do that. I can't code for that, so we're not doing it. So the securitizing, so I, I will, I appreciate the uh, provocation, but um, I don't think there is any benefit whatsoever to even using the rhetoric of security when thinking about privacy because, and I see this in, with Democratic politicians, well, A, I don't care what the Republican commissioner on the FTC wants for the advance notice of rulemaking. Like, they lost, and they can go live with that. Um, but I also see it with Democratic politicians, right? I don't want Chuck Schumer uh, proposing a bill to improve security because he would also think that, you know, he's done it and he's raised his hands and won't move on as well. So I don't want to give any... Um, uh, perhaps weak-willed politician who goes with the flow, goes with the um, uh, zeitgeist of the time to give them an out. And securitizing privacy, I think, gives them an out. I'll just respond you. very quickly yeah. and say that it, in the vision of security that I have that's broader, it would include significantly more than technological fixes, mm. which was the point of the previous yeah. book. Yeah. <laughs> uh, great, yeah. I guess as the sole representative of uh, the engineering side of the story. So firstly, I love the book, particularly chapter four, mm. uh, which walks through the various traps, um, the coding trap, the encryption trap, mm -hmm. the, and so on. And as I was reflecting on it, uh, you know, so many things we just don't do on the engineering side. And I think you bring out very rightly that focus in engineering has been on efficiency, and I guess, uh, I would say we talk a lot about safety, or bridges not crashing, or uh, things like that, but uh, privacy is not something that we even touch upon, uh, at least for the uh, outsider privacy focus courses, and I'm going to come to that in a moment. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this bottom-up expectation that you had in the book, that engineers will somehow even have the training to discover the private traps, I think currently doesn't doesn't exist. There are vocational students who might and I wish this event was taking place in School of Engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, I think <laughs> instead of lawyers <laughs> talking to lawyers, I think right. we need to talk to expose the engineers to it. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the uh, additional comment, I think uh, it's not true that in engineering we mix security and privacy. We actually do understand it to a I mean, certainly lack of security can lead to data breaches and therefore have implications on privacy, but we also, uh, I mean, my colleague Yuan, who spoke uh, earlier today, um, uh, there's, there are people who sort of cover, I'm sure you've heard of things like differential privacy mm -hmm. and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so there is a technical take which is emerging, uh, but it still only addresses a tiny part of what kind of the book addresses, I think. Mean, problem is a lot, lot broader, and I would say it's probably more about ethics than privacy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, trust in our organizational structures, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. management structures, and so on and so forth. I think lack of privacy is just an outcome mm -hmm. of, of, of that. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to think of it from an education perspective. I don't think this problem is going to get solved 
if people don't understand and appreciate and value privacy. And it has to be lawyers understanding what technology can or cannot do. I see a lot of, let's say, implications about technology, which I know is not possible right now. And yet we read in media that, you know, this thing can be done by AI. No, mm -hmm. we can't. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, it's, it's a, uh, maybe someday in the future, but I think yet. Likewise, I think engineers understanding uh, these issues so that we can identify, like for example, is there a better way in the design phase for doing something instead of collecting this data if there's something else or reduced amount of data. Um, yeah. I don't know whether engaging lawyers early in the design phase is the answer. I think a lot of these systems are way too complicated and all for, for it to be meaningful. Mm -hmm. But I think training engineers to spot these things may be a better bet mm -hmm. and perhaps mm -hmm. courses which uh, are taught by law school mm -hmm. and engineering school, mm -hmm. uh, or minors in this direction, things like that. I, uh, but uh, I think I think these uh, yeah. the coding trap that you brought out. I think is really yes, values can't be coded uh, unless we understand the values to begin with, right? right. Uh, so I love that chapter. I think a version of it would be something great for engineers to get exposed to and think around and. Uh, you know, I obviously love uh, a lot of the rest of the book, but I think you're also speaking to the managers. It's not yeah, simply the right. engineers, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, and so I think I think uh, yes, the, the, that whole pipeline. But I think particularly for these techno social systems, engineers are the first. Uh, uh, if we don't catch these things at the design phase, I think it's too late, and, yeah. uh, and I think that's a dialogue. Uh, so I don't have any question for you. I think I think mm -hmm. I'm extending the hand. That I think somehow we need to make a more meaningful uh, marriage happen between the two sides. I mean, maybe like I said, court taught courses or things like that. Yeah, I think that's absolutely important. And there are too few schools that have those kinds of. You know, there are even some schools that they will have an ethics requirement for their engineers, but the ethics requirement can be met by this list of courses that includes swing dance, right? So, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not joking, right? I'm not joking. Right? That's, there's a school, nor quite a bit, a little bit north of here, where you can meet your uh, ethics requirement for your technical degree in engineering by taking a swing dance class. And that just shows you how, again, this is so, for the, the neoliberal university is also seeing it as performative. <laughs> yeah, and that's, 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 that's because that's I think our education system is similarly driven by procedural uh, yeah, by managers, office, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> we need our ABIT accreditation, they require that ethics, and so a bunch of courses, yeah. uh, um, uh, but I think, I think addressing it at a much, much deeper level right. is what's... Absolutely. Okay. So I think what, what, I, what I was trying to do in this book was it is so common in lots of different literatures for lawyers to sort of rag on the engineers to say they're not diverse, they're, they don't understand, they, they're, they're designing tools that are um, un, uh, uninclusive or they're designing biased tools. But what, as what you're noting and what I try to write in the book is that tech, this technical expertise is mediated through bureaucracy, mediated through organizational structures. There can be tons of, of engineers that are focusing on privacy, but the company has the power through its organizational structures to minimize their impact in so many different ways. And that may not create false consciousness among the engineers. It may make their job, it may make them hate their job, or it may just make them have no impact on the end result of the product, which is really part of the problem. And, 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 and that absolutely is. But, uh, I would also like to add, and I think currently our engineers are just not even trained to think about it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I think, I think that's, yeah. the, that's also part of the challenge. Yes, uh, security courses are required, but, yeah, but privacy courses are not. Yeah, exactly. uh, Thank you. Um, okay, so I'll start out by saying that I think I was put on this panel to you know start some stuff because <laughs> my last published paper is called, is about algorithmic impact assessments. Um, <laughs> the other thing I'll say is for or against? What was that? <laughs> well, I will answer that in about twenty seconds <laughs> um, and ninety pages. Um, <laughs> so uh, the other thing I'll say is that. I absolutely love this book. Uh, every time I read Ari's work, I remember how much more I love Ari's work. Um, and f few, I think there are just few um, 
works of scholarship I've read that have had me take a piece I was working on and take a screeching turn <laughs> into a different direction. And so I'm, I'm writing this impact assessment piece thinking how great this was going to be, this brilliant idea that everyone's starting to finally talk about. I'm going to make impact assessments. I read, you know, an earlier version of this in a paper, and I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> um, and, and so then I rewrite this whole draft, and it gets, it gets so, I'm so influenced by the work that I send this draft to Ari, and he's like, please fight me less. Um, <laughs> anyway. I remember that. I yeah. said I wanted more Andrew. Yeah, no, 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 right. It was very generous of you. <laughs> but it, like, totally reframed my thinking. Um, anyway, so just wanted to tell that story. Um... So I am thoroughly convinced the law is broken um, and is going to be managerialized and every solution we're going to possibly come up with is going to fail. Um, and so, so what are we going to do with that, right? So, so the, first thing, um, I, the first thing I wanted to, actually before you, you, your book ends a lot more optimistic than absolutely, your talk. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, And so based on the book, I was going to ask you if there is any daylight between, you know, um, like this optimistic, you know, ideal you have in here, and like the end of capitalism, yeah, um, right, like as the only possible solution. And it seemed like at the end of your talk, you're like, actually, no. Yeah. So I won't ask that. Um, that's, a good, that's a good discussion point. Right. <laughs> Fair that. enough. Fair enough. Um, but it, I mean, it seems like right. What you're what you're actually saying is what we need is like wholesale. Um, cultural and political reform that makes us take this a lot more seriously at a much more base level. And you talked about having organizations, you know, um, you know, support the ideas of privacy, and only then can we get the kinds of change we're talking about or, or concerned with. And I wanted to think about your idea about the structural reforms you mentioned at the, at the end of the talk. Something like a tech public option, you said, or requiring companies to sell algorithms to give up trade secrets. I think the same reason we don't have those laws in place is the same reason we have the managerialized, um, you know, everything you talk about. And so I don't even know that those are structures because we can't get those laws until we've already reformed mm -hmm. cultural and political thought about privacy. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, so I'm really like ready to give up on everything. <laughs> um, but I did want to talk about one, one specific thing that I thought was really interesting um, and maybe has a wedge to start thinking about how to do some reforms. Um, so, once again, like everyone else, we bring up your traps chapter. Um, lo loved the chapter, right? They talk about the choice trap, the efficiency trap, the growth trap. The one that struck, the two that struck me were the bystander trap and the turf trap, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Which is really, the bystander trap was a claim that um, you had a lot of people saying, uh, okay, the, the privacy is someone else's job, right? Like, I'm just the engineer. I don't think about that stuff. And the turf trap was kind of the opposite, mm -hmm. which was saying, um, you know, anybody who's going to talk to me about privacy is getting in my way. Mm -hmm. stay, off, stay out of my lane. Mm -hmm. right? They're both about sort of the division of labor, um, and which the division of labor and the division of information, right? So day one on a computer science curriculum in undergrad, you learn about abstraction, about formal abstraction processes, right? Which is an information management technique that is required to build systems. Mm -hmm. And it's emphasized on day one because it is such a fundamental part of how to do engineering, mm -hmm. um, which I see as very, very similar and what's generating these bystander and turf mm -hmm. like um, reactions, right? Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if there are two separate things going on that it's worth teasing apart, right? One is that there there have to be divisions of information and divisions of labor in order to build systems. You just, you, there's just no other way to build anything complex, in a complex organization or a complex technical system, right? Um, and engineers are very much trained from day one in that. And so any, as long as we have engineering, we're gonna have these kinds of divisions of labor. And so I wonder if the example you gave where it's divided in the way that you have to go through four levels of management before you get to talk to a lawyer, that's not required by the bystander trap, right? Mm -hmm. So I wonder if there's like particular targeted um, reasons that privacy in particular is siloed um, or, or that the siloing of privacy 
makes it less effective in a way that, say, siloing QA, mm -hmm. right? Like quality assurance, um, like application testing, right? When I was when I was an engineer, I was doing design work, but the the chip layout was a, was someone else. Um, applications testing was someone else, and the product still went through those, and we took them seriously, and they worked because mm -hmm. we couldn't sell them otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe. Maybe it's worth not just, I mean, this to me thinks, makes me think that there are some um, parts of the engineering process that are more core to engineering as a process mm. and others that are less so, like not having values in design training or like ethical training very early that can be reformed. And whether it's worth trying to tease apart to understand engineering processes in a way to say what is core and can't possibly be reformed and what we can reform. Mm -hmm. And once we start thinking about that, having some sort of gateway to reforming organizational culture, because that's really what we need to be doing mm -hmm. here, according to your work, is target organizational culture as reforms, right? mm -hmm. organizational structures. And so to, to me, I think understanding what is and is not core to the engineering process might be a way to do it. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was thinking That's about. fantastic. And um, first, let me say, Andrew, that I think there are fewer, I don't think there is any better compliment to uh, an academic when someone says that their work Change, how, made them think differently or, or had an impact. So uh, thank you so much. That makes me feel so nice. Um, and what I, love about, what I love about you as a scholar is that you know, we, we come from different backgrounds. We think about problem, similar problems from a very different perspective. And we may have different solutions, but we learn from each other in a very constructive way. And I I see that in a lot of our, I'm getting a little emotional. Uh, we, see that, uh, we see that in a lot of our community, and it is um, partly because of the uh, scholars here, then you can remark bringing us together. So um, I really appreciate that, and I think y you exemplify those that, um, uh, that uh, uh, approach as well. So I'm really grateful for that. I um, mean, it means a lot. And it means a lot. That's why I wanted to take a moment to say that. And, and now, um, <laughs> so uh, to your first question. So I, I, I made a strategic choice to end the talk with nihilism because I just wanted people to laugh. And, um, and, but I did, and I also wanted to give the panel, uh, give this an opportunity to be generative. So you're right, the, the last chapter talks about um, ways we can make even small but important non-reformist changes that who knows if they're going to work, but they may be able to try. And I, although I'm very sympathetic, I, I'm very sympathetic to the idea of burning it all down and building it back up again and real changes to capitalism, to the extent that we are in capitalism as opposed to managerialism as a, as a, as a vision, but the building the uh, chain, short of that, we do need other things to do. And you're right. And there are, I, I still believe that there are things that we can do, and I'm, that's the project I'm working on now, and I don't know the answer to that, and I think that's okay for us to not know the exact answer. And one of the things that we're that Julie Cohen and I look at when we think about how to bring the rule of law to managerialism is we look at your work, and we look at Woody and Neil's work, and we look at Danielle's work and other people's to consider, you know, what what are more structural and anti-subordination approaches to this kind of work. So I really appreciate that. Um, so the, uh, but on the point of these, like, are there certain things that can't change and are there certain things that can change? There is, I think, a lot of work to be done, not just in changing how we educate engineers. I think there's also a lot of work to be done in culture of the information industry corporations that even little tiny changes can make a really big deal. And there are these beautiful studies in organizational sociology that will show that even when you put two people sitting next to one another, you, know, you just put the, their chairs, their cubicles or whatever near each other, it changes the work that they do. You, I had the opportunity to compare the um, privacy approaches or the, the data dissemination, or the, well, not privacy approaches, the, the way in which co two companies uh, share data among two queer-oriented dating apps. So uh, Grindr, which I think many of us know as the largest um, geosocial dating app geared toward gay and bisexual men, and a smaller one called Scruff, which is a, an affinity group oriented one, but still very popular. And um, Grindr has made a strategic choice to 
not, care not at all about the safety of its, of its users. They share HIV data, they share geolocation data in um, dangerous places. They have been a tool of murder and harassment and Grindr doesn't care at all. Um, Scruff, on the other hand, has made different choices. They have made the choice to not be as large because scale offers, scale creates problems of implementing rules. They have different choices about how to flag false, racist, or harassing accounts, taking the advice of um, people like Danielle and CCRI and others and Carrie Goldberg who have worked, and worked on this case, but also because they are not so big, they have a literal office where everyone sits together. And having the opportunity to be to, in, uh, this wasn't one of the companies that I observed for the book, so I can mention it, having the opportunity to sit there and see how they do their work, there is not one decision that an engineer makes where they're not talking to someone else about it. And it's almost like how, I mean, we all write our own ideas, but there are very, there, I don't think there's a single paper that I've ever written where I haven't spoken to Woody, Neil, Danielle, Julie, uh, so many other people, right? And the moment you talk to, and, and people outside your field, even more, right? Like uh, people like Karen Tanney at, uh, at the University of Pennsylvania who does disability, has no connection to our field, but oh my God, her comments on a paper was just so amazing, right? So the, you can do something as small as putting two people next to one another and you can change the culture and you can change just how decisions are made. Those, the ability of small organizational so social engaging, engagement changes to have such a big impact, that's what gives me some optimism. Can I ask you yeah. a follow-up? Like, how can, can, how can we think of law um, influencing those kinds of organizational, mm. organizational structural changes? Mm. Like, what kinds of law, what does that look like? Yeah, that's a really good point. And maybe this is some of the things that... Maybe this is where Woody's point earlier of, um, it, you know, there's, uh, companies now have a fiduciary duty to make profit for their shareholders. Maybe there is value in um, using law to change that kind of directed, so that, that, that's um, obsessive pathology, right, toward making profit and having, and, and you know, going back to a time where there were, you can consider other values. And if other values are integrated, maybe that's a start, right? Maybe there's also power that can come from the bottom, right? So I don't, I don't feel that revolutions happen in courtrooms or in legislatures. I think that revolutions and change happens from people. So I'm very critical of the IAPP in this book. I, the IAPP, as I've written about, it is, is a, uh, a tool of industry. All they do is just parrot privacy is control and it benefits them because the people, who, the companies who sponsor their, um, their conferences are these, mostly these, outs these privacy compliance outsourcing vendors who companies pay gazillions of dollars to to sort of do privacy as sort of like Mad Libs, if you remember Mad Libs, where <laughs> you just kind of insert a number or insert something in a line. And, these, and they sponsor IAPP conferences, so they can't be neutral. But what, imagine what could happen if we had a, um, a, an alternative, an alternative union of privacy professionals that are graduated from schools like UCLA and others, of people who really care about privacy as a tool of anti-subordination, and they create, they, they come together and build power as a union and say, and, and because of who they are, because of their mission, it will be actually the case that if a company hires them, that they will, they will, they, they will resist co-optation. And maybe we can have legal protections, right, that prevent a company from firing uh, the Timnit Gebrews, right, and firing just anyone that says something against the bottom line. Maybe we, have, we rejuvenate those kind of, those rejuvenate rules that give people power, uh, democratize these corporations because neoliberalism has just has um, taken it in the opposite direction. So maybe there is this relationship, as I think we t many of us teach our law students, that although revolutions don't happen on the, in courtrooms, right, we need the 125,000 women marching in Seoul. We need people who are committed to privacy. We also need the protection from statutes. And that's just the beginning. We should continue that conversation. All right, I think we've had 15 minutes for questions, so...